Welcome, sermon number 42 from True Love Chapel. This is an online video uh, Christian preaching and teaching ministry with a focus on our Lord Jesus Christ, focused on uh, being good Christians, and one of the ways of doing that is through learning sound doctrine, and it's very important, and so uh, that's one thing we're doing. We're going through the Bible. We've been following the ESV study Bible reading plan to, uh, to go through the entire Bible and learn more. I'm learning, you're learning, everyone's learning. I usually give uh, sermons on the New Testament, and, uh, but these last uh, few times we've been in uh, Daniel and Ezekiel, and then we're going to get back into the New Testament. So this is the last one. We're going to finish out Ezekiel. Uh, today and this is going out October 23rd 2016 so let's pray Almighty God please bless us in our Bible study please um, teach us the truth give us new insight into your word and please continue guiding us and leading us in uh, in our, you know further our understanding of you God and we pray that you uh, forgive us for our sins we pray in Jesus name amen all right well uh, so here's what happened okay it's kind of a long story but um, just the important part here last week this the reading assignment brought us up to Ezekiel 38 and then um, but since the topic seemed to change right at chapter 38, I decided we'll cut it off at 37 last week and pick it up with 38 and, and on this week. And I had planned on preaching on chapters 38 and 39, prophecy against Gog. You know, Gog and Magog, sound familiar from Revelation? Well, and, uh, and all of this study of Ezekiel I mean we've learned a lot actually we've we've I've really learned uh, a lot it's been a beneficial study um, I'm glad we did it but there are still some unanswered questions we don't understand everything eschatology you know study of end times is very uh, this is tough it's complicated it's it's not easy people don't really uh, all agree on it and uh, you know, top theologians are are not agreeing on it, and uh, and that's okay. You know, we agree on the the main and plain things that there's one way to the Father that that's through Jesus. The only way to be saved is by placing your faith in Jesus. All Christians believe that, and we also believe that there there's going to be a final judgment, a heaven and a hell, an eternal state. And all that so we believe that about eschatology but the exact timing of how everything works out how the event the timeline of events um, it's it's confusing it can be confusing um, not everyone not everyone agrees on it and that's okay it's not something that the church needs to divide over um, you know, I was in uh, Calvary Chapel before. That's where I went to Bible college. Calvary Chapel teaches a pre-tribulational rapture sort of end-time view, which is what most churches are teaching. And, uh, and um, I had some issues with that view. Though, I mean, there's, it has its strong points. It has its weak points. There are different views. Um, I think most churches follow that pre-tribulational view. And, um, you know, that, which is actually a, a recent innovation in the church. Um, it's just, uh, I don't know the exact date that it, that came out, but it's within the past one or two generation from now. I mean, the whole century is 2,000 years leading up to this. The church did not have a pre-tribulational rapture view, which doesn't necessarily mean that it's that it's not true. Maybe they had it wrong. Maybe we got it right. But 
personally, I have problems with the, the pre-tribulational view. And I want to talk more about that when we get into Revelation towards the end of the year. But we sort of run the risk of uh, just jumping off the deep end, I guess, uh, with all of this. Because, like I said, it's a secondary issue. It's not the main thing. Um, it is an interesting issue, though. And, um, but I think it's okay it's okay for a church to have uh, to discuss the various viewpoints and the merits of each view on our together as we search for the truth you know it's not just cut and dried like you have to believe this one view in this church it's not that uh, we're, we're gonna we're gonna debate it and dis discover the truth and so we have a, a range of possibilities that gets narrowed as we study more and more and hopefully we can understand some of it because um, like I say it's complex God's plan is is complex it is deep and uh, not all of the stuff in the Bible was necessarily written to us I mean this Bible was preserved for us but some of the things were written to other people at different times in history and so we look at it now we can be confused especially this one about Gog you know in chapters 30 and 39 Gog and Magog um, you know it was saying like basically um, here I'll read the opening parts the word of the Lord came to me son of man set your face toward Gog of the land of Magog the chief prince of Meshech and Tubal and prophesy against him and say, Thus says the Lord God, Behold, I am against you, O Gog, chief prince of Meshech and Tubal. And I will turn you about and put hooks into your jaws and bring you out. And all your army, horses and horsemen, all of them clothed in full armor, a great host, all of them with buckler and shield, welding swords. Persia, Cush, and Put are with them, all of them with shield and helmet, Gomer and all his hordes. Beth to Go Garma, from the uttermost parts of the north, with all of his hordes. Many people are with you. Okay, be ready and keep ready. You and all your hosts that you are assembling about you, and be a guard for them. Okay, um, well, okay, next verse. After many days you will be mustered, and in the latter years you will go up against the land that is restored from war, the land whose people are gathered from many peoples upon the mountains of Israel, which had been a continual waste. Its people were brought out from the peoples and now dwell securely, all of them. It's describing a coalition of nations coming against Israel. Um, it talks about them coming from the north. Now I've heard... Um, these prophecy pundits uh, describe this as Russia coming against Israel. And when it does say in the, the latter days, uh, or in the latter years, um, that that's what they think that it was for today, if you want to take it literally. But you know what? And, um, and by the way, Russia is due north of, of Israel. But you know what? If you want to take it literally, you know, it's talking about all of them with buckler and shield welding swords. Well, we don't fight with swords anymore, do we? See? So it's you're not actually taking it literally if you just say if you say that it's gonna be a coalition of nations coming against Israel in the modern times. So I believe this is this is a prophecy. Ezekiel gave concerning something that has already happened um, in ancient history and um, I don't know if history has fully uncovered everything about the details of this event but the Bible describes it pretty clearly here and it goes on to say that basically that this coalition would come against Israel to plunder it and to steal its you know its goods and everything its riches and then there would be an objection there would be a war um, and then uh, 
and then that God would save Israel by pouring fire and brimstone down on Gog of Magog and um, destroying them. And that there would be so many dead bodies. I, I think it said it would take them seven months or something to clean up all the bodies, to bury them. And then, or was it that? And then also they were taking the weapons, the arrows and the shields and things and burning them as fuel. And I think that was for seven months also. You know, you can read the story to get the details right. And then if you want to further understand it, let's go to Revelation chapter 20. Because it mentions it again. In Revelation 20. Am I right? <laughs> well, we got the thousand years. Uh, never mind. We're not going to do that. I think in uh, Revelation, it may not have been chapter 20. It may have been another chapter. I'm sorry. Um, my notes for this sermon are not extensive. I, I started out with the idea of preaching on this Gog and Magog. And then when I realized that there are a lot of unanswered questions about it, I think that that's not the important part. Um, it's what I, what I believe it is, is here it's talking about something that happened in ancient history. And then in Revelation, it mentions it again using Gog and Magog as a um, just as an example of a coalition of nations which are enemies of Israel um, that's my best understanding of it so far so great um, and uh, you know what hold on give me one sec So, because now I'm curious, um, I think it is in Revelation 20, I was right, let's go there, hmm. <laughs> I'm glad you get to see that my sermons are not meant to be polished, entertaining, um, theatrical pieces, this, this is this is real sincerity. This is me studying the issues and just sharing with you what I've been studying. And we're all learning together. We're trying, we're sticking to the, to the good doctrine and all that, but we're trying to figure out how the Bible, um, just we're struggling with it together. When we go to Revelation chapter 20, yeah, let's, uh, verse seven through 10. And when the thousand years are ended, Satan will be released from his prison and will come out to deceive the nations that are at the four corners of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them for battle. Their number is like the sand of the sea. And they marched up over the broad plain of the earth and surrounded the camp of the saints in the beloved city. But fire came down from heaven and consumed them. And the devil who had deceived them was thrown into the lake of fire and sulfur, where the beast and the false prophet were. And they were tormented day and night forever and ever. So, well, after the thousand years, we were just talking about the millennial kingdom here in Revelation chapter 20, which uh, Revelation, by the way, it's the most symbolic book. It's the most poetic uh, book full of imagery. And most of that imagery comes from the Old Testament. So to understand that, we have to know something about the Old Testament. So it's good that we've got to go through Daniel and Ezekiel at least this year. But uh, the millennial kingdom, personally, the view that I'm looking at is uh, something which was is being taught by the uh, Christian Research Institute. And it's about um, uh, basically that 
now is the millennial kingdom, the reign of Christ, and um, that there is no rapture. There's a second coming, and then that's when we're raptured. That's the rapture, and then that's the end. Um, that's my understanding of it now. And uh, I definitely want to give you a lot more information on that so that that can make more sense. If you don't agree with it, that's fine. We have to look at the uh, all the evidence and decide. Um, and, uh, you know, a thousand as a whole number, one thousand used all throughout the Bible, throughout the Old Testament, everything. Not to mean necessarily literally a thousand, though it is also a thousand but the meaning is a vast amount. You know what I mean? God owns the cattle on a thousand hills. It doesn't just mean he owns a thousand hills worth of cattle and a thousand and one is not his. It means he owns everything. That's the meaning of it. So a thousand years reign of Christ is like a, uh, it's like a vast reign of Christ which I believe we're in now. And, and how does that work? It's like um, the devil was bound for a thousand years or a great time. The devil being bound so that he could not deceive the nations. Remember before, um, before the time of Christ, Israel was pretty much the only nation that had the knowledge of God. And they were surrounded by all these pagan nations who didn't have a clue. But now... In the church age, we have people of all nations and tribes that are being saved, okay? So, there's a lot of symbolism going on there in, um, in Revelation. And we're going to look more about that uh, at a later date. Um, so, there was confusion dealing with Gog and Magog. And if that was confusing enough or wasn't confusing enough, you turn to chapter 40 and from 40 to the end of the book it ends in chapter uh, 48 so those last chapters there is uh, Ezekiel's temple vision so he had a vision of this temple um, and it was a great big temple and the all those chapters are describing all the measurements and details of it and uh, and then in including the Levitical priesthood, including the temple, temple rites and sacrifices, the sin offerings, and all this. And uh, it was sort of a, an ideal Jewish experience that it was being described um, in this enormous temple. Um, written around the 6th century B.C. And... Well, the problem is, where's this temple? Where does it fit in? Okay, that, and that is a problem because in history, we don't see any temple like that being built. Okay, um, Solomon's temple was already destroyed at this point. And um, so there was no temple standing in Jerusalem at the time of this vision. So it could not have been Solomon's temple. Zerubbabel's temple, the rebuilt temple, um, that comes to mind, but it's actually, it was much smaller than the temple described in the last part of Ezekiel. Um, so, that doesn't seem, it doesn't seem to fit the description. Is it the church? Some, some people want to spiritualize it and say that the temple is the temple of, of you know, we are the temple of the living God, the church. But then what about, I mean, all these, all these details about the size and shape of the temple, uh, that doesn't fit the size and shape of me. Okay. So more people consider it could be a millennial temple. Uh, a temple that exists after the second coming of Christ and then in the so-called uh, king the thousand years reign of Christ the millennial kingdom okay uh, could that be it well 
that is unlikely because um, okay that is unlikely because um, why would there be why would there be a Levitical priesthood reinstated in the millennial kingdom when the Le Levitical priesthood has been abolished and judged and we talked about that last week and that now Christ is the high priest forever after the order of Melchizedek okay forever Christ is our high priest no further need for priests and also sacrifice why would there be sin offerings um, present in the temple if Christ is already our sacrifice once and for all so it seems unusual that um, that it would be a millennial temple you know and I just said that my personal belief is that now it is the reign of Christ you know the millennial kingdom is now so I don't I don't think there's gonna be a second coming a millennial kingdom and then another uh, uh, then the devil would be released again okay I don't think so I don't think that's what the Bible is teaching I think the Bible is teaching that Christ is reigning now at the right hand of God in his resurrected body uh, from heaven and um, and then that the church we are um, you know God is living in in us through the Holy Spirit and so it's it's a time of of truth being proclaimed to the world and people being saved everywhere so the devil is no longer allowed to deceive the nations completely now you know that's it's an incomplete deception and there you know there's devil but there's also demons who are also doing his dirty work and they're also still at large you know even if the devil is bound so I think that's what it's saying and then at the end of the the reign of Christ at the end of the church age would be the devil would be released again and then that there would be a, another war a big war and then that would be Gog and Magog again another coalition of enemies coming against Israel probably culminating with the battle of Armageddon and the second coming of Christ at which time we are all raptured the, the church uh, the ones who have, are living and the ones who have already died they're all going to be raised up and so we will ever be with the Lord okay well we got to turn to uh, we have to turn to Hebrews let's go to Hebrews chapter 10 Hebrews chapter 10 Christ sacrificed once and for all. For since the law has but a shadow of the good thing, things to come, instead of the true form of these realities, it can never by the same sacrifices that are continually offered every year make perfect those who draw near. Otherwise, would they not have ceased to be offered? Since the worshippers, having once been cleansed, would no longer have any consciousness of sin. But in these sacrifices, there is a reminder of sins every year, for it is impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins. Consequently, when Christ came into the world, he said, Sacrifices and offerings you have not desired, but a body have you prepared for me. In, a burnt offerings and, in burnt offerings and sin offerings you have taken no pleasure. Then I said, Behold, I have come to do your will, O God as it is written of me in the scroll of the book. Okay. When he, when he said above, you have neither desired nor taken pleasure in sacrifices and offerings and burnt offerings and sin offerings. These are according to the law. Then he added, behold, I, will, I have come to do your will. He does away with the first in order to establish the second. For by that will we have a sanctification we have been sanctified 
through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once and for all. And every priest stands daily at his service, offering repeatedly the same sacrifices, which can never take away sins. But when Christ had offered for all time a single sacrifice for sins, he sat down at the right hand of God, waiting from that time until his enemies should be made a footstool for his feet. For by a single offering, he is perfected for all time those who are being sanctified. And the Holy Spirit also bears witness to us. For after saying, this is the covenant that I will make with them. And after those days, declares the Lord, I will put my laws on their hearts and write them on their minds. Then he adds, I will remember their sins and their lawless deeds no more. Where there is forgiveness of these, there is no longer any offering for sin. Based on Hebrews 10 there, we see that um, God has put an end to the sin offerings once and for all with the sacrifice that Jesus paid on the cross. And there's no longer a need for it. And he never really took pleasure in it anyway. The sin, those offerings cannot forgive sin. God cared about people's faith and obedience. And it wasn't about the, the offering. So if that's the case, the vision of the temple in Ezekiel. Um, and I think if anything we get out of this whole message, it's this. It is this one point here. It is that Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ is the lens with which we can see into the Old Testament and understand it. All of the Old Testament points to Jesus. The, the, the whole Bible is God's plan of redemption. And it all points to Jesus. And, um, and uh, you know, Jesus Christ is the culmination of God's plan. So to understand the scriptures, to unlock the scriptures, we need to see it through the lens of Jesus. Uh, and um, so that means the, the New Testament the teachings in the New Testament, and um, <coughs> excuse me, sorry. So um, the teachings of Jesus and the apostles, which also helped to clarify the teachings of Jesus, they were with him and they were able to explain it better. But um, but that's it. So the witness in the New Testament says that God has put an end to temple sacrifices and uh, and to the priesthood. The Levitical priesthood is gone. We have Jesus Christ as our high priest. Okay, it's uh, it's a priesthood after the order of Melchizedek. Okay, so if that's the case, what I believe we have here in the uh, the, the temple vision of Ezekiel, and uh, and this was the same thing that I was reading up. Uh, through the uh, Christian Research Institute, they put out some information on it too. But uh, what it what it seems to be is this is a vision of what might have been. Okay, after the the Babylonian captivity, after the seventy years of exile, when they were free, they were set free and allowed to go back to Jerusalem, and then they have this vision of an ideal Jewish existence in. Jerusalem with a new marvelous temple well what happened they didn't do that they didn't go back to Jerusalem uh, most of them stayed in Babylon most of them preferred to stay in Babylon um, in their pagan uh, city versus going back to Jerusalem so and as a result of that their punishment was multiplied uh, was it seven times and uh, and it took them all the way to to the year 1948 when they were finally allowed to reestablish their uh, nation again so it feels like um, because of their rebellion they were not able to to get the thing that they wanted um, you know what I mean it's it's like uh, Jesus said uh, I'll paraphrase this quote but it was something like oh Jerusalem um, the city who stones and kills the prophets. How long have I 
how often have I longed to gather you together as a hen gathers her, her chicks or her eggs, and yet you were not willing? Okay, I'm paraphrasing that, but I think you, you know the one I'm talking about. So God was, God was wanting to gather Israel together and to strengthen it, but Israel was not willing. And so it didn't happen. Okay. Um, so that's the way I see it. It's, it's a vision of something. It's an ideal Jewish existence. But their continual rebellion caused it to not happen to them. Though they did, uh, they did build a smaller temple. Uh, Zerubbabel's temple. The rebuilt temple. Which was eventually destroyed again in AD 70. But... Um, yeah, I think that that's what it is. So the lesson here is number one, having a Christ centered hermeneutic. Hermeneutic is like a method of interpreting the Bible. So we read the Bible. We need to understand uh, the language style, the st you know, what style of literature it is. Is it poetry? Is it history? Is it whatever? Um, what's the style and um, we need to and that will help us to understand if it's symbolic or if it's uh, literal and then we need to understand the context who it was written to who wrote it uh, what was the purpose of writing it then and then how it could apply to us today things like that we need to understand that the bible doesn't contradict itself that god has the same message throughout so to understand more difficult parts of the Bible, we need to take what we understand from the more simpler parts, the more straightforward parts, and apply that to the more complex, to chip away at it and try to find the answer. And then also, perhaps most importantly at all, is the Christ-centered hermeneutic, where we recognize that the entire story, God's story of redemption, is pointing to Jesus. The ultimate fulfillment of that redemption is through Jesus. And so uh, that's the way we understand the, uh, the Old Testament and the New. Um, good stuff. Um, so, uh, so we're back into the New Testament uh, <laughs> next week, which may be a good thing. Um, I, I enjoyed the, the Ezekiel and the Daniel. There were some really great moments in there, uh, some really great prophecies. A lot of the, the prophecies, um, a lot of times it, it's hindsight is twenty twenty, as they say. So the prophecies that were already fulfilled we, in history, we can see, that, see them in hi history, compare them to the prophecy, and realize that they match. And then... Um, realize that it's a prophecy and uh, Jesus also said something like that he said I tell you these things so that when they happen you would believe he said uh, something like that and I'm paraphrasing but it, that's one way it's the prophecies um, that we see them after the fact and we realize that they match up and then that is a, a point of evidence of in support of Christianity, in support of the inspired word of God, especially when you have thousands upon thousands of such prophecies. Okay. And, but I'm not saying all prophecy has to be like that because some prophecy points to the future and some things about the future we are allowed to know and some things we're not supposed to know. Like we're not supposed to know exactly when Christ's second coming will be. But, uh, but it is there for a reason. I mean, all of Scripture is pointing towards this end, which where where all is restored. I mean, well, when when everything is redeemed and put in its proper place, in, including the evil will be banished and abolished and sent to hell forever, and then the the good, which is which is Jesus. Jesus is what is good. So when we accept Christ, we put our faith in Jesus, then God responds to that decision that we make by putting the Holy Spirit in us. And, 
you know, writing his law on our hearts. And then, so then we'll have Christ living in us. The life of Christ manifest in us is another name for the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. And um, so there, that causes our sins to be washed away and we'll be declared righteous. We are positionally righteous in Christ and um, we'll, we'll ultimately be practically righteous as well. You know what I mean? So and then we're restored in, in brought into heaven for eternity and uh, to live on the new heaven and the new earth and in the new city of Jerusalem forever and ever. Um, to focus on the things that we can understand. And uh, some things, like I said, um, even future prophecies can sometimes be understood. You remember the, the wise men who went and found Jesus when, when he was born. And they were able to find him because of understanding the scriptures to where they knew that he would be born in Bethlehem on this year and, and this and that. So they were able to seek him out and find him. And they were the wise men, right? Well, they must have really been wise if they were able to look at uh, scriptures and realize that that was happening. Obviously, God helped them, you know, gave them the wisdom. But it is possible to, to look at future prophecies and understand when they're going to be exactly fulfilled um, with God's wisdom and help and blessing, obviously. But for the most part, um, I think the most part, it's easier. It's much easier to look at things that have already been fulfilled and to realize that that's what it was. And, um, and then, you know, all this talk about end times and everything, it's, it's not the most important thing. We know that God has a plan, and um, it's interesting to try to figure out that plan. I mean, you can almost hardly resist as a Christian. We, we just want to know when, when and how the end of the world is going to take place. It's just curious, but it's not the most important thing, is it? Uh, God is the one with the plan. And we're just the ones following his plan in humble obedience and submission to God. And it's not necessary to know the big plan. We need to know where we fit into that plan and what, what we need to do. What's the next step we need to take? We take one step, God tells us another step. We take the next step and the next as God leads us along the way. And then God will cause everything to work together. And so we are standing on the promises of God revealed to us in the New Testament that by placing our faith in Jesus, we become children of God and that we will be saved, that we are saved. We have passed from death to life. And then um, we're children of God, heirs of God, and sealed for the day of redemption by the Holy Spirit. That's the important thing. And then once we have that for ourselves, we need to to let to spread that love to others. And that is that is love. God's love that was poured out onto us. And then we share that love with others, that truth and that love. Um, so it's it's the Great Commission. Make disciples of all nations. That's nations. That's our job here. Uh, our job is not to to worry about end times prophecies. Uh, that's just a secondary uh, thing, which is fun to look at. But it's not it's not that important. Whether there be a millennial kingdom in the future, whether now is the the spiritual millennial kingdom, whatever. It's confusing. We don't know. We'll keep studying it. Uh, it's in the Bible for a reason. So I believe God wants us to struggle with these issues and uh, to find answers to our questions. But um, you know what I mean? It's just it's not the most important thing. The most important thing is that we put our faith in Jesus Christ and then we surrender our lives to him. We learn to live lives of obedience to him. We practice the good spiritual disciplines, good habits, prayer, Bible study, 
fellowship, uh, fasting, ministry, and uh, worship, worship of God. And that strengthens us, that brings us closer to Jesus, into a better fellowship with God, and a strong relationship with God through the Holy Spirit, where we can pray and know that God answers our prayers, and that God can speak to us, and we know what He's saying. Uh, with we just know our spirit knows our you know the the spirit the holy spirit testifies to our spirit that we are children of god and also testifies and leads us into to truth and uh and this this truth is jesus and this obedience is living out the christian life and spreading that love to others uh, that truth and uh, hopefully that others may be saved. So uh, let's pray. Almighty God, thank you, God, for um, our Bible study. And uh, it was a tough section of scripture. Sometimes we don't always understand all the prophecies, especially the ones relating to end times. But help us to understand the things that you want us to understand, the things that are important especially the relationship with Jesus that we desperately need. And so please bless us. Let us put our faith in Jesus Christ. Help us to, uh, to lead others to Jesus also. Help us to be good examples of Jesus and uh, representatives of the kingdom of God. And... Um, we also pray for the, uh, the upcoming elections in the uh, United States. Please let your will be done and let the, the right candidate win. Because we pray for peace and prosperity for our country, but we pray for Christian values and peace and prosperity for Christians so that we can continue to, to do our job well as Christians, to exercise our ministries and to... Uh, Hopefully, you know, do a good thing in this world and lead people to Jesus. That's what we want. Help us to do it. We pray in the name of Jesus. Amen.